Hey, this is Steve Halleck of TikToking.com, and today we're going to talk about what I've learned from the art market when it comes to watch collecting. Let's go. Alright, welcome back guys. It's been a little while since my last podcast, sorry about that. But I am going to try to do a series and continue on this theme of the best way to actually build a watch collection. Now this is going to go a little bit deeper, a little bit more philosophical than a lot of channels and podcasts like to go on this, but this is kind of how I think about these things. So before we talked about how I like to look for quality over quantity and a few of the reasons for that, but I want to back it up another step even and talk about an area that I get a lot of uh, sort of, eh, maybe inspiration is not the right word, but uh, data from, and that is the art market. Now. I'd like to preface this by saying I am by no means a world-class art collector, nor am I an art expert. It's just an area that I have interest in and have been around a bit. And also there are a lot of things that are definitely different between the art market and the watch market. However, I think there are a lot of important lessons to learn and I want to run through them a bit in this video and podcast. So the reason I like to bring up the art market is that it's way more mature than the watch market. There are people who were artists, were gallerists, have galleries. It's been going on for, well, thousands of years. But also there's an entire really codified profession and schooling around it. So people go and get graduate degrees in art history. They write books, you know, all of these things that don't really exist so much in the watch world. We're a bit new to all of this. Now, if you want an example of this, just look at the auctions. You know, sometimes I'll bid on watch auctions and, uh, you know, I run through the whole auction and whatever, and then maybe the next day the same auction house will have an art auction and I'll be watching online. And in the watch market, you know, things are hammering at 10,000, 20,000, maybe for a really big lot, it's like 300,000 or in the extreme, like, auction leading sales, maybe over a million, and then you get to one of these art auctions and it's like 10 million, 20 million, 40 million, 6 million, stuff you've never heard of, 2 million, um, you know, really, really incredibly diverse and mature market. Um, so I think it would be a mistake if we don't take some sort of knowledge from this area. And there's a couple really important parts of it that I want to focus on. Now the first is that the art market is really good at a sort of general taxonomy of things. Now, uh, what do I mean? So, again, I mentioned that people go to school for these sorts of things. There's a real knowledge around what's going on in the art market. So, you may have heard of terms such as contemporary art, modern art, um, abstract expressionism, impressionism, uh, all of these uh, types of things, even going way far back. You've got Baroque, you've got all these different sort of styles, and there are ways that uh, art experts like to classify periods of things that were going on. So this is a really useful framework, and it's not applied nearly enough to the watch world. Uh, so let me give you an example of this. So, uh, for example, in, in, in the art world, a lot of times you'll have groups of artists that are influencing each other in one period of time, and they are kind of producing similar work. They're playing off of each other in a way. Uh, you have a maybe a Picasso who is making sort of... Um, uh, changing a uh, human form to some extent, and then you have surrealists um, building on that in their own way, and then you have Picasso reflecting that uh, in his work. Uh, forgive me, art guys, I'm going to screw all of this up, so don't take the specifics too strongly here, but 
The point being, you're able to then later on in history look back and immediately recognize a work and say, hey, this is part of this period. This was what was going on then. This is what came before it. This is what came after it. These are the influences that were going on here, and this is why we see this sort of work. Um, now, this is important for a few reasons. So, once you are able to classify a thing in this way, then it makes it much easier to see who are the important players and what's the important work within this area. Um, so, this is the way that I like to think of my own watch collecting and also the watches that I buy for inventory. I'm particularly interested in this narrative of the contemporary watchmaking, which to me is uh, sort of from, let's say, 1996 at the very earliest, although really 98, 99. Um, and I think we're still in it, although it's always hard to tell exactly where a movement ends until it's already over. So maybe we'll reflect back later and say we're in the middle of it. Maybe we'll reflect back later and say uh, it ended a few years ago, actually, and we've moved on to something else. I'm not totally sure. But in any case, let's look at this as like a contemporary watchmaking period and see what that gets us. So just like in art, we need to understand what came before and how we got here, right? So I think it's important to note that this is all post courts, right? So if you're looking at painting, it's important to recognize the invention of the photograph, right? This changed the nature of painting. It was the case that painting was mainly used to depict everyday things or people or whatever. It was an important medium for that. Photography came along and painting no longer had to represent reality. And so it was free to break out of that into a modern or postmodern form where it could start to work on higher concepts uh, than just this is the fish and the apple that is on a table, right? Uh, so watchmaking faced this similar thing in the 70s with courts. Before then, there was artistry in watchmaking, of course. There's higher quality things, but it really was a craft. Uh, and it was all about who could make the best, the best performing watch. And then, of course, uh, most beautiful and these sorts of things. Now, enter courts, which basically made a better watch. It's the same as photography to painting. You no longer needed mechanical watches to tell the time. It stripped the function right out of mechanical watches. Uh, and so, where did that leave everybody? Well, for a while, people thought that the Swiss watch industry was going to be dead, and it definitely could have gone that way. But after a bit of time, luckily they survived the initial wave and finally found their footing in this other medium that really could be there for a true artistry that was divorced from the need to be a strict timekeeper. Now this is important because you fast forward 20 some years and you have a group of watchmakers that were born and came up in an era where this was their new reality. It no longer necessarily made sense if you're an extremely talented watchmaker or a visionary uh, watch designer or these sorts of things, um, maybe it no longer has to be that you design just the most functional watches. You can now start to let your creativity go a little bit and work a little bit more in the field of art. So, okay, so where does that get us now? Well, we needed a couple other little recipe items in this mix in order to get us the cake that we needed here. And a big one of those is the internet, right? So you're a tiny creator, you want to make something amazing, but how can you actually find people that will know anything about this and buy it? Because after all, it takes a lot of money to build a watch. Uh, just the gold alone, uh, if you want to make a gold case or, you know, whatever parts you need, they're expensive. So the internet comes and starts making it more and more a reality for these guys that they can find customers wherever they are in the world without having to have the millions of dollars of marketing budgets that these bigger brands have. So it's not a coincidence that 
you start seeing these things pop up, these companies, with kind of the rise of the internet, right? 96, 97, really early. 98, 99, picking up a little bit of steam. 2000, 2001, 2002, now we're cooking a little bit, and then boom, 2003 and onward, really, uh, you've seen a really golden age of independent watchmaking. So let's go to the beginning of this and see kind of what's happening in this world, right? And I wanna do this by talking about some kind of fundamental pieces, most of which you can find reviews of on my channel. So I, uh, I urge you to go look at uh, the watches themselves and go through them as I'm uh, discussing these. But to me, there's, there's kind of several very important pieces that create a chain, right? Uh, you have François Paul Jorn, doing his whole thing. He has an aesthetic, he's a very sort of uh, brilliant watchmaker, but has his own real point of view on independence, on what a watch should be, what a good watch is, and so he starts making his kind of very classic pieces. Uh, at the same time, or actually a little bit earlier even, you have Philippe Dufour, who's making very classic pieces, but very high complications. We're talking at this time his Grand Sonnerie, which he made six pieces of, and then his Duality, which he made nine pieces of. And so, it's on a very high end, but it's showing people that independent watchmakers can produce stuff at the extremely high end. Uh, at the same time now in that classic, so you have this box, classic stuff. You have Kari Vudalainen. Kari is uh, teaching at watchmaking schools. He's working at uh, Parmigiani. He's working uh, all through the valley and gaining a reputation. Uh, but he is now really starting to build uh, kind of one-off pieces in his own time that are exhibiting the highest, highest level of craft and of complication. So the, maybe the best example of this are his decimal repeaters, where he came up with a totally new uh, way of sounding the time, right? So this is gonna be a theme that comes up. A new way of telling the time is about to get very important, but a new way of sounding the time Kari Vudalainen in the 90s starts working on this and is working with these uh, incredibly high-end vintage uh, minute repeater bases and then embellishing them to the nines, reworking everything. Okay, so you have all this going on over here. Okay, now over here you have a whole other group of people and this is the sort of the maniacs of the group. Uh, Vianney Halter comes out with his Antigua. This is a relatively standard sized watch, but the dials are all moved over to the side. So you have a perpetual calendar where each indication is on its own separate dial and it has this whole steampunk kind of vibe. Uh, then you have Urwerk. Their big hit is the 103. That comes along in 2003, right? This is the first watch that really is a just totally crazy case. It, it lends almost no similarities to what we think of as a standard watch case, and it has an innovative way of telling the time with these Maltese crosses and discs. Now again, none of this is totally reinventing the wheel. There had been perpetual calendars, there had been watches with discs, there had been tonneau-shaped cases, there had been all of these things, but this is a matter of exactly how the elements are put together and in what way. So you start seeing these foundational pieces. And these catch the eye of Max Bucer, who at the time is with Harry Winston Rare Time Pieces and has started the Opus series, where he initially took Francois Paul Jorn, which was Opus 1, right? He sees this guy, he says, look, you're making amazing stuff, you're launching your brand, I have this great company, uh, or, well, bigger company, right? Let's do something together. I'll promote you, you make a cool watch for me, win-win, right? And then he sees Vianney Halter's Antigua. He says, this, this thing is amazing. I've never seen anything like it. We've got to do something. They make Opus 3. And then Opus 5 with Felix Baumgartner of Urwerk. After he sees the 103 in 2003, he says, look, we've got to do something. This guy's the rising superstar here. Uh, and they make the Opus 5. 
So these are kind of the foundational pieces that lead us into around 2004, 2005 and set up this movement. So we start with the ingredients needed to create a movement, a break, something different from the norm. And then we have this kind of cast of characters that shape this narrative into what it's going to be. And so after that, we see these different branches go in a lot of ways. A lot of watchmakers come into this more classical way because that's their aesthetic. They want to make uh, beautiful, more classic watches, more classic complications, but in a way that can be made now uh, that is uh, it, some brings some sort of independent flair to it. And then you see a ton of people come into this area, uh, the Urwerk area, where they say, uh, okay, there are, we can now make crazy cases, we can make crazy time indications, how can we play with this idea? Um, and within there, there are good creators and there are bad creators, just like you can look into any art movement and you say, there are good artists, there are not as good artists. Uh, also, there are famous artists, they're not as famous artists, they don't always go together, right? But once you have this framework, then you can start sort of seeing what goes on. So if somebody comes to me and they say, hey, uh, I'm looking at a, maybe a Francois Paul Jorn, or maybe a, I don't know, I don't, some other guy, right? Well, unless the other guy uh, has made something really important, which there are plenty of those people, but let's just say it's a, it's a Joe, Sh Joe Schmo and it's something that he just kind of likes. I'm going to say like, look, this is a foundational person of this movement. Um, and just on that merit alone, if you like them equally, I would go over here. So I hope this is making sense because if you start breaking this down, you can create your own taxonomies here. I, I don't, I'm, this is just arbitrary. This is my own viewpoint. This is what I'm seeing, but this is the framework where I collect watches in. So I really encourage you to build your own framework, figure out the narrative in the area that you like, and really do some research and figure out, okay, what's going on here? What's important? What led to what? And it doesn't necessarily mean that the initial stuff is better than the later stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that you have to like one thing or not, but it really elucidates what's occurring in these areas. So let's fast forward this a little bit. Um, you now have the classic area, you have the little bit of crazy area, and you can see influence starting to occur. So I would take uh, in this area, you know, people love to ask about Acrivia right now. Well, Acrivia is sort of a direct descendant of this area. You can see their influence from these guys and how these guys created their pathway to where they are. And I would say, once you know what's good and what's bad and have developed your own taste, again, quality over quantity, you can say, wow, these guys are really worthy of being put in this camp, right? Same thing on the crazy side. Anybody can make a crazy case. Anybody can make a crazy time-telling display. Not everybody deserves to be in this sort of pantheon of a group. So you can look at a, uh, you know, uh, what's another, uh, maybe, maybe Debethun in some of their crazier pieces belong in this group. Although at some point a sort of hybrid group comes on in the middle that is a little bit classic and a little bit crazy. Maybe they're more in here. But for now, let's say they're in here. So at Devathun, you can see, and you say, wow, these guys were obviously inspired by the ability to create wild stuff that uh, Erwerk and Vianney Halter really opened up. Um, but they're doing it with really innovative mechanics, their own balance wheels, their own uh, automatic rotors, their own escapements, all sorts of really crazy stuff and finishes like nobody's ever seen. So Devathun has a very specific style. They've taken from other people and learned some things, but they are also bringing something very new and at an extremely high quality to the table. So, okay, great. Now we can put them in here. Uh, versus, uh, let's take a, I don't know, like a Frank Vila or something like this. So this is a these kind of came and went at some point, and they were like a crazy case design uh, with 
uh, you know, whatever movements and whatever from anywhere, the quality just wasn't there and the originality just wasn't there. So if you're in it at the moment and you're looking like, uh-uh, crazy watches are this cool thing, this is a cool watch, it's got carbon fiber, it's got this, it's whatever, you may think that it belongs in this area. Uh, but if you really know and you've developed your framework and you're figuring out, okay, this leads to this, this is this, people that I know, respect, trust, are kind of uh, vibing in this way and kind of agree that these are the important things, you can see that that doesn't necessarily fit in this category. And maybe it's not one of the most important kind of artists or people in the area. Um, and those are the brands that tend to not kind of have the legs, right? So when I'm curating the pieces on my site, which are pieces in my inventory, they're stuff that I actually buy, this is what I'm trying to kind of do for you. I'm sort of trying to sort the wheat from the chaff and say, these are the guys that are important. They belong in this, right? Whether you like the crazy side, whether you like the classic side, whether you like to be in between, let's not quibble with that at the moment. That's personal preference. But the guys that I like to sell, I like to buy, I like to promote, all kind of belong in this tent. I feel comfortable that they are the people that matter in this area and are pushing this movement forward, right? And I think this is really, really important and forms the backbone of everything that I'm doing when I'm looking at do I want to buy a watch or do I not want to buy a watch, which is the same basically for inventory uh, for me as it, it would be for you to buy because I'm really trying to buy the stuff that I like and want and would want anyway. Um, and I apply it also as a watch collector. I think, okay, do I want to put this in my personal box? How does it fit into this framework? Uh, and then you look at your own personal preferences, tastes. What do I like in there? Do I want more classic? Do I want more crazy? Do I kind of, um, am I more sympathetic to this ethos of this company or this founder, this creator, you know, whatever. This is the fun part where it's really up to you. Uh, but I do think that you can't really do that until you have a more codified framework as to where you are. And this is what the art market is really good at. So another thing that the art market can teach us is that not everything has to be for everybody and good art can be difficult art. Uh, I often have people ask me about pieces like, let's say the MBNF HM4, you know, who would wear this? Who would buy it? And it always makes me think, you know, have you ever been to an art gallery or a museum and you see a work and you're like, who would buy this thing, right? Like, I get that it's good art. I get that people think it's good art, but how did anybody sell this? How does this artist make a living? Like, what is, how does this even work? Um, and I think that it's worth taking some of that also from the art market to the watch world. Now, in art, I'm sure the vast, vast, vast majority of buyers are looking mainly for decoration for their homes. You know, they have a space that's this big that they want a piece of some sort of vibe or color or whatever to fit in. And then maybe within then they are looking for uh, the the best artist or the best uh, you, whatever their preference is or something, but they're mainly looking for decoration, right? Um, uh, then you have a much smaller subset of people that really know what they're doing and are kind of buying stuff that uh, they think is good regardless of whether they kind of like it or not. They, they're just kind of collecting. Um, and anyway, there's a lot of different kinds of these things and not one is right or wrong. It's perfectly acceptable to buy a painting just because it looks really great in your living room. Uh, however, that doesn't necessarily make it good art. And if a thing doesn't look good in your living room, it doesn't necessarily make it bad art, right? And so I think that you have to look at what it is that you love and what it is that you're looking for. So I have a lot of collectors that are actually very conservative, uh, you know, normal guys uh, that maybe buy an HM4 or an HM9 or a Wild Urwerk or, you know, a Blue Debethune or, you know, a fully diamonded out 
uh, you know, whatever. Actually, I've never sold something like this before. This one I just bought for myself. Uh, but it totally fits the bill into this category, right? These pieces may not be their personal style. Uh, in fact, I've never sold an HM4 to somebody who I would say like, oh, that's exactly this guy's personal style. Who even has the personal style where a rocket ship shaped watch uh, or jetpack watch would fit into it. I don't know. But that's not these guys, right? More, it's people who just really appreciate a thing and aren't afraid to wear it on their wrist. They're getting their own pleasure out of it and don't really give a damn what other people think. Now, this is important because it is a way to build a really great collection. Um, if you look at great art collections, they generally have, the collectors are willing to take some chances, right? You don't see a great art collection, really great, that is just the, the hits from everything, the stuff that would look good on anybody's wall. Um, if you really want to get into this, you have to develop your own taste and you have to be willing to kind of go out on a limb and say, you know what, whatever, I don't care. This blue diamonded watch, uh, this isn't necessarily my own personal style or taste, but it's the most beautiful watch that I've ever seen in my life and I'm gonna buy it and I'm gonna enjoy it and I'm gonna pull it out of my box and it's gonna make me smile. This is a whole other level of collecting and I think it's important to touch on this because again, the art world is much better at this than the watch world is. We are falling into the trap even more so now than ever of the most popular things being the thing that everybody wants. Uh, everybody wants a Nautilus. Everybody wants a steel Rolex. Everybody now wants really early Jorn. Um, you know, whatever. And th those are all great. They're all totally great things. Um, but when you get uh, all these people who are too focused on wanting the thing just because they can't have it, wanting the thing because they immediately will make a profit on it, um, wanting the thing because they can sell it if they feel like it later and, you know, make some money or whatever. All of these things are kind of not really related to how to build an actually good collection, how to really appreciate watches, how to really understand them. And so they're not invalid. Uh, and, you know, plenty of people have conversations on what is important in terms of building, uh, you know, wealth through watches or where do you want to invest or what's the coolest thing that everybody wants or whatever. Um, but it's definitely not the way to get actual enjoyment out of it. And really, it's not the way to love watches or to uh, participate really in the growing of the watch industry in terms of knowledge, collecting, um, enjoyment, these sorts of things. So uh, I know that this stuff exists. I have no problem with it, but it's just not the area that I want to spend my life in because I love watches and I love this area just like I love art, there's something actually important about these things and I want to communicate uh, to everybody how to view these things in a little bit more uh, serious manner. I guess this is a little bit serious, you know? People are spending a lot of money and it's okay to be a little bit serious about it every now and then. People are very serious about art and I think that uh, it's important to be a little bit serious about watch collecting and thinking, where are these things important? What makes them important? Uh, what are we doing here, basically? And so that's the point of this video series. There's tons of other things that we can learn from art. Uh, you know, for example, there's pop art. Maybe that's what uh, more uh, Nautilus is or that sort of thing is right now. You know, maybe... Uh, Maybe the Nautilus is this year's version of a cause statue or something like that. So you can buy it at an art auction. You can make money on it. You can, it'll look cool. It'll look great. People think it's awesome, whatever. Um, but I don't know. What does it say about you as an art collector? Again, maybe a bad example. I like that stuff. But I'm trying to present a, a kind of specific point of view here, right? So anyway,
I'm gonna go more and more into this topic. I'm gonna create an entire series of videos on, I think, this contemporary, independent watchmaking thing, right? But I wanted to lay the framework here so that we have something to refer back to and so you guys know what I'm talking about. And so when you see me talking about certain brands or that I just love certain brands, you can see the framework under which I'm placing all of these things and gaining their importance. So I went on for way too long this time. I get really passionate about this stuff, sorry. If you guys like this podcast or this video, please hit subscribe in your podcast app or hit subscribe on YouTube. You can sign up for alerts on my new videos down there and I'm gonna do many more in this series. So I hope I'm not boring you too badly. Anyway, that's it for now. Thanks.